brings the challenge of fire from the skies. The most common type of fire bomb is the lightweight magnesium incendiary, shown here. Its purpose is simple, to demoralize the people and to overtax the local fire departments and air raid precautions units. One bomber can carry as many as 2,000 fire bombs in one load, enough to start about 150 fires, unless each bomb is quickly cold. The problem seems answerless because professional and auxiliary firemen must be dispatched to only the most serious fires. This is where you are needed to protect yourself, your family, your home and community. The answer lies in your hands. Fire bombs are dangerous, but you can control them effectively and with reasonable safety. And here's how. First, the bomb itself, 14 inches long by two inches in diameter and weighing approximately two pounds, falls nose downward guided by its tail fins. The body of the bomb is a shell or tube of magnesium with walls about one half inch thick. Backed in the center of the shell is thermit. And at one end of the shell is a starting mechanism. In its downward flight, the bomb gathers sufficient speed so that its impact forces the firing pin into a percussion cap, which ignites a starting mixture. This in turn ignites the thermit compound, which fills the core of the bomb. So violent and intense is the thermit reaction that it sprays flaming metal over a considerable area. Stay clear of the bomb during this violent period to avoid being splattered by burning sparks of molten metal. Thermit consists of iron oxide and granular aluminum. All burning requires oxygen. In thermit, the iron oxide is able to supply oxygen to help the aluminum to burn. Because the thermit carries its own oxygen supply, there is no way to extinguish it by smothering and no way to extinguish it by cooling below the burning point because it burns at the extremely high temperature of 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit, yielding molten iron and aluminum oxide. The purpose of the thermit is to burn hotly enough to light the magnesium shell, which will now burn intensely for 10 to 20 minutes, during which time it will start a serious fire if left unattended. Magnesium, like the aluminum in thermit, must have oxygen to burn, but unlike thermit, which contains its own supply, Magnesium must obtain oxygen from the air or elsewhere. If somehow the air supply could be cut down, we would be able to cut down the burning of the bomb. One way to do this is by using sand. Take this example, for instance. A bomb has fallen into the attic. The violet thermit reaction has finished. The magnesium is burning, but the fire has not spread. So a shovel and a pail of sand are brought up. Pouring most of the sand onto the floor, we start to work. First, shoveling sand over the bomb. This covering of sand makes it more difficult for air to reach the bomb. Thus, though sand will not extinguish the bomb, it will slow up its burning and cut down the heat radiated from it. Notice how close to the bomb the operator can work under these circumstances. Since burning magnesium actually reacts with the sand, the bomb does not long stay completely covered, but erupts through the sand blanket, much like a seething volcano. A few inches of sand are placed in the bottom of the pail so that the bomb will not burn through and carried out. Then the bomb and sand covering are scooped up with a flat-nosed shovel and dumped into the pail. You can see how important the straight edge on the front of the shovel is in making a clean job of scraping up the bomb. After covering the bomb in the pail with more sand, any traces of molten burning magnesium or burning wood embers left on the floor are extinguished with water spray from a water type extinguisher. And then thrusting the handle of the shovel through the pail handle, which by now is too hot to touch, the pail, bomb and all, is carried downstairs to be dumped outside where it can do no harm. Surprising but true, is the fact that water, which puts out ordinary fires, acts as fuel for burning magnesium, speeding up the process of combustion. Oxygen is considerably more concentrated in water than in air, and the burning magnesium is able to decompose water and extract oxygen from it to support its burning. A solid stream of water applied to burning magnesium causes a dangerously explosive reaction. 
The solid stream forces water into pockets of molten magnesium, forming steam of tremendous pressure, which shoots out, spraying burning magnesium in all directions. On the other hand, water applied in the form of a coarse spray is the best method of handling magnesium bombs. The spray speeds up the burning of the magnesium, reducing the life of the bomb to about two minutes and wetting down the surroundings, thus restricting the spread of the fire. The lighter weight of the spray keeps the water on the surface of the molten magnesium and steam is dissipated without the explosive effect caused by a solid stream of water. Perhaps the simplest and most common device for producing a water spray is a garden hose long enough to reach the remotest part of the attic or top floor. It should have the usual adjustable nozzle which can be changed from a spray for the bomb to a solid stream for extinguishing fires that have spread in the surroundings. But there always remains the danger that water pressure may fail in a crucial moment during an air raid. Water mains may have been bombed or fire apparatus nearby may be draining and lowering the pressure in your locality. So don't count solely on a garden hose. Another convenient source of water with self-contained pressure to produce an effective stream or spray is the standard soda acid extinguisher, which is turned upside down for use on fires and held that way by the bottom handle so long as water pressure is desired. In this instance, we have the most probable situation. As you arrive on the scene, the fire is spreading fast in materials close to the bomb. Using a solid stream, control this fire first. Then, breaking the stream with your thumb partially over the nozzle, create a coarse spray, which is correct for use on the bomb itself, keeping a watchful eye, of course, for any flaring up of the surroundings. To completely extinguish a fire bomb and to bring the average blaze, which is spread from the bomb, under control, two extinguishers are desirable. And now, a second one is brought in to finish the job. Embers left to smolder are dangerous, so avoid any later flare-up by assuring yourself that none remain. All other water-type extinguishers, loaded stream, gas cartridge, or foam, are suitable for use on magnesium bombs. Here is a foam extinguisher. Starting off with a spray for safety to avoid a possible explosive reaction, the foam is directed at the bomb, which in this case has fallen onto a concrete garage floor. After the foam blanket has started to build up around the bomb, it is safe to change to the stream. Gradually, the foam builds a blanket over the top of the burning bomb, while the water in the foam feeds the burning magnesium beneath and speeds up the fire. Occasionally, the bomb will burst through craters, but for the most part, the foam blanket serves to cut down the heat and glare. Finish off the bomb with another foam extinguisher or any other convenient water spray source. Only water-filled or water solution types of chemical extinguishers are recommended for use on magnesium incendiary bombs themselves. All other fire extinguishers will perform the same effective service on fires started by incendiaries as they always have on fires started from other causes, but they are not effective on magnesium. If you arrive before the thermit reaction is finished, take cover until it is over to avoid the danger from spurts of burning thermit or a possible explosive charge which would reveal itself during this initial period. When the bomb has settled down to simply burning magnesium, go to work with a solid stream, first on the fire which is spread from the bomb. Then switch over to spray on the bomb itself. Used here is a device called the pump tank, which carries a supply of water that is forced out through its hose by pressure from the hand-operated pump. This is a particularly clear illustration of the manner in which the water spray wets down the area surrounding the bomb, as the bomb itself is being rapidly consumed. The pump tank may be equipped with hose longer than the standard length, which gives it the only practical feature of the English stirrup pump. The long hose aids in fighting incendiaries out on roofs and up in attic lofts, where to carry anything but a hose would be difficult. With the long hose, of course, the device will require additional manpower. A second man pumps while the hose operator gives his attention, first to the fire resulting from the bomb, using the solid water stream. There's no point in spraying the bomb first while the house burns down around you. So bring the spreading fire under control to start with. 
then give the bomb the works. Incidentally, you'll notice that the further you put your thumb over the nozzle, the finer the spray. Too fine a spray fails to feed enough water to sufficiently accelerate the rate of burning of the bomb. And it is this cutting down of the total burning time that makes water so desirable a method of incendiary control. A third man is necessary to refill the pump tank before it's empty, so that the pumper can maintain a steady pressure of water for the hose operator. This third person also keeps a watch in other parts of the house for any spread of fire or other fire bombs. He refills his pail from whatever water supply is available. Of course, if a sudden flare-up of the fire occurs, it is wise to shift from the bomb for a moment to bring the spreading fire under control. But the sooner the bomb is out, the better. So get it out of the way as quickly as possible. And then see to it that all traces of the fire that may be burning or smoldering are put out. Tests have shown that certain thicknesses of roofing materials will resist penetration, and they are shown here. Most home roofs are not this strongly constructed, hence it is expected that if an incendiary bomb crashes through, the bomb will come to rest on the upper floor. So let's inspect the attic with our air raid warden. Like most attics, it is cluttered up with as fine an assortment of fuel as any incendiary bomb could desire. So out with the clothes and other things which are removable and which might catch on fire easily. A few back issues of magazines at the wrong time could help to make your house more than a back issue. So out they go too. And let's clear out the dollhouse attic, including the dollhouse itself. Clearing the attic will reduce the danger of fast spreading fire there. But a bomb may still burn through and penetrate the ceiling of the room below. Then you will have to put out fires on both floors. So, if your local building department approves, some protection against burning through attic floors will be gained by laying overlapping rows of building paper and then by spreading a layer of two inches of dry sand. Over the sand, place wooden frames with chicken wire stretched over them, four to six inches above the sand, so that it will break the fall of the bomb and prevent it from scattering the sand. Keep equipment accessible, ready for instant action. Fire extinguishers should be kept properly mounted for easy access and inspected and recharged regularly. It's easy to keep a supply of sand and shovels on hand. And pump tanks should be kept filled with water and in a handy place. The bathtub makes a splendid reservoir which should be kept filled in case water pressure fails. And a wet blanket may be used thus for protection when entering a room during the thermit period of the bomb. Now let's review what we've learned. Remember first to control the fire that has spread from the bomb using a solid water stream to do it. Then deal with the bomb either with sand in the approved manner or if using water, be sure that only a spray is directed at the bomb itself. By these simple tested methods, you can cope with the menace of fire from the skies. And this does mean you. For if incendiary air attacks occur, all able-bodied members of the community must and will defend their lives, property, and self-respect so that when the all-clear sounds, the threat of incendiary bombs will be reduced to these harmless ashes.